give a hand to Dan Harvison. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to get this thing tucked in here. Woo. How are you guys doing? It's after lunch. I didn't bring the t-shirt cannon today or blaze. We had a game last night, so uh, to start, start firing that off. But I did bring some stuff to throw to you guys um, afterwards when we do some Q&A. Um, let me grab the clicker, because that would help to advance that. You guys just don't stare at my first slide. Um, how many people are using the hashtag today? Think we've used it? You guys know what it is? Delight 2012. So hashtag Delight 2012. Um, I've been sending a couple things out there. Hopefully you guys do the same. If you guys want to use my handle as well for Twitter, it's Darbison, D-A-R-B-I-S-O-N. I learned something new that usually when I spell my last name, I use uh, B as in boy. I'm now going to be saying B as in brilliant. I think that's pretty. B as in basketball. Oh, brilliant sounds so much more food. So um, I'm going to talk with you guys. Uh, you know, I'm going to cruise through this, this presentation, um, but I really like interactivity. And rather have you guys shout out questions and take me off on a really random path if you guys want me to talk about something different, uh, because. Where this is, uh, this is a presentation that I've, I've put together. I'd much rather have a dialogue with you guys because there's a lot of really bright people in this room. Um, so, but with that being said, uh, we'll, we'll kind of go through this. So, digital entertainment. I work at the Portland Trailblazers. We have a, uh, a division in the Trailblazers. It's a large department there. We used to just kind of be a standalone under marketing, and then in about 2009, we combined to be with our broadcasting department, television and radio. So it's TV and radio, game operations, video production, IT engineering, and then digital. And really what this formed was the content arm of the Trailblazers. These are the, the people who tell the stories about the organization um, and really trying to create these, these content platforms to have conversations um, around the, the team and the games and with the fans. So to kind of go through some of the digital things that we do, I wanted to kind of give a brief history um, of the Trailblazers. I mean, it, it really helps to know where the, the brand was and where the brand uh, is going. So um, Blazer Rainia is born. We were founded in 1970 by Harry Glickman. Um, and the at the beginning, even, uh, there was a swarm of people that, that liked to follow the team. Uh, but it was an underdog all the way through, even going to 1977, we went to the playoffs. We were the first team, uh, that was the first year making the playoffs, we won the championship in 1977. The first team to do that, in their first go-round of uh, making the playoffs and then winning the championship. So it was a very pioneering trailblazer thing to do of us winning the, the championship. What that also generated was this buzz around this town that uh, was amazing and it still beats today, Blazer Mania, Rip City. And that's something that we really appreciate, but have, it's interesting to talk with other people at, at Brandt where it's, it's somewhat, um, we don't take for granted, but it, it makes things uh, easier at times or more difficult at times, depending on how your product is and how people are engaging with you. But by nature, our customers are fans. And most brands would love to go and have their customers as fans. So uh, Blazer Media is born in 1970. So we went through a time um, back in uh, back in the days, the dark days. The, the team continued to win. So take you through a quick 1980s. The team is making the playoffs. Late 1980s, early 90s, we made some runs to go to the finals. Very golden age of, of Trailblazer lore with Clyde Drexler and Terry Porter and Jerome Kersey, Cliff Robinson, Kevin Duckworth. These guys today, when they walk into a, a room or, or a Fred Myers here in Portland, they're recognized instantly. And so uh, everybody really you know, felt passionately about this team. Well, those, those players got older, either they were traded or they retired, and uh, the team needed to fill in behind them and put in some new, new players uh, and they, they kind of had a, a transition with general manager, uh, uh, kind of the executive management. They started valuing athletic ability over character. So we went through this really tough time where the team was still winning but with the wrong guys. Frankly, the guys were getting in trouble all the time and it started becoming 
um, you know, something that, that Portland as a community did not want to identify themselves with. I am frustrated with you, the Trailblazers. I used to call you my team. You don't reflect me. You were getting in trouble. I don't like it. So we had this brand separation, which is a very difficult thing to repair. It's not anything easy to do because once people have separated, how are you going to talk with them to be like, no, no, we've changed things around. We've got to, we've got to come back. So, you know, kind of coming back into um, really the, the turnaround for the organization came around 19, uh, 2004, really doing some brand exploration, figuring out, seeing that, that the team wasn't winning and people weren't going to games um, and they were frustrated and we were listening. So we really uh, started the turnaround in 2004, 2005, 2006. But because the brand was separated, it was hard to convey that. So um, we started to uh, look at ways we could communicate with fans through non-traditional ways, especially because our relationship was, at the time, kind of tenuous with the major media outlets in town. And so um, we wanted to connect through innovation. So in 2006, we launched on the trailblazersfan.com. That was the first standalone social network for a sports team. Um, the concept actually originated from, hey, there's people that are still Trailblazer fans out there. Let's do some video testimonials and really humanize and show that it's safe to be a Trailblazer fan. Put that up on the website, put a little profile with them. That ended up looking like, wow, you know, that's very similar to MySpace. Facebook was not open at the time. It was just MySpace and Friendster. And um, it took a lot to get that sold up the chain because what we take for granted right now as far as rules for social media didn't even exist really in 2006 with a lot of real-time communication. Um, and so we launched I'm a Trailblazers fan to really figure out an, another way to connect with fans that are still hardcore and still engaged with us, but then hopefully to evangelize like we do right now on social media. And it was successful. In 2007, we had the number one pick in the NBA draft. It came out, we weren't supposed to get it. It was uh, surprising. We had just announced Brandon Roy as Rookie of the Year. We were we had a, a core group of, of young basketball players that looked the future looked pretty bright. Then we landed number one pick in a very a highly sought after NBA draft where the number one pick would have its pick of two future All Stars with Greg Oden and Kevin Durant. So we quickly launched uh, the, the Oden or Durant microsite. And uh, we won a couple of awards for that. We got a ton of traffic. We obviously know where the pick went. Um, and, um, but we had a really good way to leverage the digital traffic that we got to listen. We had polls on there. That was when we launched Twitter in 2007 around uh, the draft to give inside looks. Hey, we, were, we just picked up Greg Oden from the, uh, from the airport, took him to his, uh, his, his workout. Uh, I just want to keep you guys up to date. It's very much, there was little, there's some communication, but a lot of it was real time uh, push updating. We did that on the micro site, and then as Twitter evolved, we also evolved. Uh, we streamed our games online in, in 2009. This was to uh, kind of test the waters. Uh, we did 16 of those games uh, to our market in Oregon and Washington. We continue to go and do that today. Um, and there's not, there's no other NBA teams that, that are doing that. That's due to legal reasons or contract reasons, but um, or they just don't want to test it out. We want to make sure we try to get this the, the content as many people in, in front of them as possible as we can under our contracts. Finally, in 2010, we launched Trailblazers.tv. This is we looked at the way that we actually have our video, a very visual um, con a piece of content um, and product that we wanted to take the video experience and evolve that and make that better. I kind of feel that, and I still feel this, feel we need to continue to go and um, kind of evolve this and learn from it and, and, and really figure out the best way to serve this up. The video content is all kind of built off of almost a YouTube clone, which was built off almost an, an e-commerce looking site with a grid and um, you know the, the top things are floating at the top. I'm not saying that we broke the wheel and made a better one, but we did try to do some new things with Trailblazers.tv. Uh, one of the big things that we've done is launched a lot of live video programming daily around um, organizations. So we do, on game day, three hours of live programming, 9 a.m., noon, and then an hour and a half before tip. Um, 
really wanted to go, and, and once people came to our website, we wanted to uh, immerse them with trailblazer information and engaging in real time with our personalities. Because of this and some of the other pieces that we've launched, we're number one in the league in time spent viewing. Um, typically per visit, it's about 11 minutes time spent viewing. Um, an average for the NBA is about four and a half. So you can see that you know, we're more than double the, the average website for the NBA. And a lot of that has to do with Trailblazers.tv because of that, that live programming. We also launched the bloggers, or United, excuse me, in 2010. This is a specific portal, kind of like an insider look for, uh, for season ticket holders. And their program is called Rip City United. It's a membership program. Uh, and when you buy your season ticket, you're brought into Rip City United. We have a lot of amenities for our season ticket holders who are a core group. And we really like and want to activate them in an efficient way um, online. So that was the Rip City United portal that we launched. And you can't see there, it's getting cut off. It says the Bloggers Network. Bloggers Network uh, is a loose collection of our blogs for our official blogs and also fan blogs and really trying to uh, continue to cultivate that long form or even short form written text and to uh, make that in a very uh, kind of cohesive area. And so that's the Bloggers Network we've got on, that, on our site. So you can see we've got quite a bit of innovation that we, we have um, and it's interesting because <laughs> As you guys, I'm sure, are aware, there's a lot of things out there. You've got to try to sift through everything and figure out how much time and money do you have to go through all this stuff. So we have to really be choosing what we do. And I know it looks like we potentially have done a lot on this list. I'm talk a little bit more about some of the other things. It still is unhampered constantly by budget and by um, headcount. And so that's something that you have to be mindful of when you're exploring this space. This is like one of the, the best quotes that I've seen. How, how many people have heard of Bill Simmons before? Show of hands. So Bill, yeah, sorry, I'm a good fan up there. Uh, Bill Simmons writes for ESPN.com. He has a site called Grantland. He is the columnist for ESPN. And he has a special place in his heart for Trailblazer fans. Um, you can see the quote, the city of Portland that has one special team, and they care about the Blazers. I, will, I always call them soccer moms lovingly. There are so the top. Your this is talking during one of his podcasts with Mark Titus. Your Mark Titus feature had it been up for four hours and there were 375 comments under the link. You have this rabbit fan base. All they do is they take everything possible that's happening with this team. And I think that has to do with a lot of things that 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 are ingrained into Portland and in the Trailblazers fan. We're just trying to come up with ways to activate those people and to continue to spark that and to build the fire even brighter with those fans that have so much passion for the team, especially online. So one of the things that we like to so, so we do, like one of the, the main activation points that we have for digital is engaging to sell our content marketing. And that's something that, um, that we do on a regular basis, whether it's you know, updating somebody with the scores during the game, or that's uh, sending out an Instagram picture behind the scenes at practice. One of the things we're going to be doing is we're having our season launch campaign, and that's going to be launching on Sunday. Um, we are going to be doing uh, a bunch of interview videos that will be up online, and it will be up on um, television broadcasts and pay TV advertising. But the, the long form videos, interview video, videos, will be up on shareplayers.com, on YouTube, and will spread through social. Um, but it will be the splash page. And I got permission to play the two videos of Wesley Matthews and Damian Lillard. So Wesley Matthews has been with us for about three years. Um, Damian Lillard is one of our held heralded rookies. One of the difficult things that we have now, just where we're at with our, our team, we got rid of a lot of players that we had last year, mid-season. So we're starting somewhat fresh with this new team. So we really want to be able to leverage our digital assets to educate people on why they should embrace these new guys. We're not going back to the bad, the bad time of, of the organization. These are great guys, really good stories behind them that really try hard on the court. And that's what we've heard from Trevor fans. Please have guys that are going to be good guys, they're going to try every night, and then if they win, great. Everybody loves to win. But you want to make sure you win the right way. So I'm going to play two of these videos. Let's we'll see if they play across the fingers. Um, but Wesley Matthews and Damian Lord. So we haven't shown this outside in public, so you guys are getting a safe preview. 
I don't have a plan B in my mind because I feel like you do that and you don't succeed. I don't have a plan B in my mind because I feel like you do that and you don't have to succeed. That's okay. It, it may be just like the video, the video processor. This is this should be local. Well, here's the DNA. It always felt like. I don't have a plan to be in my mind because I feel like you, you do that. You don't just expect you not to succeed. Can't report that. I blame Microsoft Excel. That's a okay. problem. Talking on resources. Go get to right. We'll go and skip on. Um, so I don't have a plan B. <laughs> I was. Okay. Let me see the time. What are you doing? I always felt like I. Ta-da! The videos. They were awesome. I know. I know. Sneak preview of data. <laughs> the, um, just so you guys know what those guys are talking about, Wesley's talking about I don't have a plan B. If you don't know anything about Wesley Matthews, is he wasn't drafted by, by anybody in, in the NBA. He walked on to the Utah Jazz. He basically got invited to play in their summer league and then invited to play for their team and then kind of worked his way up from being you know, the 15th guy on the bench to being the 12th guy on the bench to being a guy in the rotation to being a starter and then that was just in one season with Utah Jazz. He was a free agent at the end of that first season, and we uh, signed him, brought him over. And um, you know, that's something that's ingrained with Wesley is he's constantly been overlooked, he's felt, throughout his life. Whether he went to Marquette, which isn't a huge powerhouse, it isn't a Kentucky, or it isn't a North Carolina or a Duke, it isn't a basketball powerhouse. Felt like he was overlooked constantly growing up. So that's something that he wears really on his heart on his sleeve um, and really likes to battle the na naysayers on that. The same thing is to be said about Damian Lillard, the, the rookie that we have. He's from Weber State. So anybody know where Weber State is? Where is it from? Where is it? That's right, Ogden, Utah. So not, I, I consider myself somewhat knowledgeable about college basketball and I had to go look up Weber State. Where is Weber State from? And Ogden, Ogden <coughs> Utah. Um, and so it's a very small college where they did very well last year, and he was second in the nation in scoring, but he wasn't necessarily on anybody's map as being, you know, that should be the number one pick. And he was drafted for, uh, by us in our, with our number six pick overall in the first round. Very high pick. We're really, we think he's going to be something special, um, potential all-star in the future. And, um, you yeah, know, but he's also been somebody who's been overlooked, an underdog, and it's interesting, I was talking to our SVP of sales and marketing um, yesterday. These guys are very similar to the Trailblazer brand of us feeling like we're an overlooked uh, organization or team when it comes to when we play other teams. We play against the Lakers. They're in LA. We're Portland. LA's big and glitzy. We're the underdogs. And so it's interesting that the guys we're drafting and bringing into the fold are, are very similar, just a fitting the brand, and that's something that's very important to us. Obviously, we saw when we deviated from that, and things didn't go very well. So here's some of our primary platforms that we have our conversations with people and tell stories. Trailblazers.com, our primary. Uh, Trailblazers.tv, as I mentioned before, our video platform. I'm a Trailblazersfan.com, which still runs today, is our social network. We've got a lot of hooks into Facebook, into that, with Facebook Connect. We're working on our Twitter hooks as well. The Bloggers Network, as I mentioned before, a lot of activity with um, blogs. And here's our social platforms. We have Facebook, Google+, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, Tumblr, and YouTube. So the primaries that we use um, are Facebook and Twitter. We added Instagram, Pinterest, and Tumblr in December to give you some numbers. Instagram, I think it's about 13,000 followers right now. It took us three years to go and get that on Twitter. So it's interesting on seeing just the growth of Instagram that it's, it's going really well. Um, and Twitter, within the last year, we have grown 
with our Twitter users for over 100,000 now. So, um, you know, really looking at growth, Facebook has flattened off somewhat. We don't, we're not growing as fast on Facebook. So grow, but not as exponentially fast. Google Plus is really weird. We got recommended as a, on the sports tier, as a recommended user. We have like more, I think we have more fans on Google Plus than we do on Facebook. We have 440,000 fans on Google Plus and 415,000 fans on Facebook. But the engagement isn't there. We don't get as much engagement with Google Plus. Um, and for various reasons, I won't go into here, but we always kind of, when we sell something, we make some money on Google Plus, like, whoa, yay! That was, do that. The guy did that on accident, you know. <laughs> but take it short. Um, okay. <laughs> New jerseys available. So let me take you through a case study of what we did. So we rolled out an alternate red jersey that would be red to worn on the road. It's um, we don't change jerseys very often. Uh, the Ducks change their jerseys every. I was gonna say every Saturday or twice a week. It seems like they see a picture. In the beginning of the week, like, what you see on Saturday wasn't the same. Like, oh, they're changing it again. Um, so we don't change our jerseys very often. But we were going to kind of, well, we wanted to do something different with our red alternate road uniforms. So um, we wa we launched that in uh, September. Actually, technically October 1st, but we did some of this stuff in September. We wanted to create a buzz to sell jerseys, create a buzz to tip off the season, which opening nights on Halloween. And that's the opening night where we want to encourage people to wear red because we will debut those jerseys playing for the first time on a Halloween opening night. So what we ended up doing is we teased on social, we leaked out some of these close-up photos so people can get kind of a look. What does that look like? What is that going to be? Put on Instagram, put up on Facebook and on Twitter, um, and then we gave it to uh, the players that kind of did their posing for us. Uh, there are models on their social media account as well. Spread that around. Um, we also made sure we had the presence on our site that mirrored that, that took people into a collection on our message boards of our different um, close-up shots. Um, unveiled the full jersey on October 1st with full photo gallery, full video package. Um, and we wanted to make sure we had clear calls to action to purchase. That's the big thing, you know, when you do all these awesome engagement pieces, but if you're not leveraging it for revenue, you've got to rethink your strategy. And so there's well, good ways to do it, and there's bad ways to do it. And we try to do what we consider a good way, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right way all the time. Um, but we wanted to make sure that if somebody were really driving people into one area to look at the uniform, there was clear calls to action for people to go and purchase. Another um, kind of uh, a program that we did was our pre-sale that went on September 26th. We wanted to go and uh, we use Facebook Connect. The people who are they using, are you guys using Facebook Connect on your guys' sites or on your client sites? Nobody? Do you guys know what it is? Okay. People connecting via Facebook? Well, the reason why we really use it quite often is we build a Facebook application and when we put it up on our site, um, people say connect. We bring that data back into our CRM. It goes actually into our I'm a Trailblazers fan database with your social network. You're signing up for I'm a Trailblazers fan with your avatar from Facebook. We're bringing some of your the personal information. We're bringing the big pieces, your email address. And that's important um, if we want to do any follow-up information or, or conversations with you. Um, especially now with Facebook throttling your edge rank, you know, looking at having a conversation just at lunch. That I, I'm sure you guys are aware Facebook is allowing, it's on average about 17% of your uh, audience to see your organic posts. Whether they really, really like you or not, during that 83%, they may not see your stuff. Which is frustrating for being a brand that people do want to consume news content from you. They don't know that, that you're not putting that out there. So this is why it's pretty important for us to connect, get someone connected with us via Facebook, <coughs> and then we can email and have that conversation with them later. So we're driving our uh, pre-sale to buy tickets for the regular season beforehand. Um, and we did our connect. Um, we promoted through our digital, digital channels. We also bought a promoted story on Facebook. Um, our first post that we did saw 13,000 fans. Um, we did a, a paid campaign and it hit 50,000. Um, and 40,000 was through paid and then 10,000 was through organic on that, that elevated post. Um, we saw with our, uh, our pre-sale for this specific list, 
we saw roughly uh, $12,000 in tickets being sold, and we uh, gathered about 300 new names in our database. Uh, that was a previous post that we did from, uh, we, we kind of seemed to do it twice, one through promoted and then, or non-promoted them, I don't know, about a day and a half later we did a promoted one. So social content is just an example of some of our social content. That This is actually a, um, a link out to a, an article by David Aldridge, somebody who is on NBA.com at the time and part of, our, um, part of our network. So here's some things that we're going to be looking at our future. Um, Mobile. So we've been really trying to get into mobile um, for actually, iPhone comes out in 2007, um, Apple announces the App Store in 2008, I went to the league and said, hey, we want to go and do something in the App Store, and they said, hey, hold on, and that's the way that, you know, a lot of times uh, the sport leagues work is they oversee these teams, teams are franchises, so they have rules and regulations that you have to abide by. So we are kind of told, hey, hold off on this, um, and so we had to hold off. Just recently, within the last year, they've come back with rules and regulations that make it uh, that make sense for us to create an app for fans, so it's not a bad user experience. So we're going to be rolling out our app uh, in the next, well, should be going to Apple at the end of this week, and then we got to cross our fingers it doesn't get stalled in the Apple Store for eons, but um, the, uh, we really, I'll show you some screenshots of our, our mobile app in a couple minutes. Um, Twitter, 6% of usage, this is just a stat that uh, the guys at Twitter uh, threw out to us, 6% of their usage is on mobile, so making sure that, you, that we have a mobile strategy was something that's very important to us. Um, mobile WAP and mobile app doing, having both. And the NBA is the one who provides us with our WAP. They just recently rolled out new WAPs and they're working out some of the bugs. We're figuring out ways to get around things. Um, but, uh, you know, looking at the, the usage for Twitter, was pretty uh, interesting. We really look at the game day experience uh, at home or arena um, being pretty uh, pretty key for mobile. The second screen at home, and then the you know not necessarily, I guess you could say the big screen is the big screen is the primary screen, but having your device in arena while the game's going on is pretty important. The major hurdle in arena is the connectivity. I don't know if you guys, how many people have been to a game? Oh, that's a good hand. How many people have had success with their smartphone in our arena? <laughs> Good for you! <laughs> it what? It was, it was at the Winterhawks, okay. The more people you have in the arena, the worse it gets. And that really is just a function of cell service and cell antennas and Wi-Fi nodes. And so this is something that stadiums and arenas across the country are really struggling with, of how do we crack this nut? How, what do we do? So we're in the process of trying to figure that also and trying to put in a better antenna system for all the different carriers and also Wi-Fi nodes because we know how important it is. We're hearing about Mountain Meadows and really want to engage around the atmosphere of, of snowboarding and skiing and sharing that with their, um, with their networks. We're, we want to, you know, we're thinking the same, same paths. Like we really want to make sure that people are sharing their experience to engage people at home to eventually get them to come to a game. The, um, like I said, it's not going to happen until we actually get some better connectivity in the arena. So here's our mobile app that we'll be launching. Um, the left-hand side is what you see non during, not during the game. What you see on the right-hand side is during the game. The app changes depending on when you launch or what's going on. And we figure the people that they're launching their app during the game, they're going to go and want some form of um, scoreboard. So it's an updated scoreboard. Um, We've got extended stats down below. We have a check-in feature where people can check in and say they're, where they're watching the game. That spreads out to your, your Facebook graph. Uh, because we want to be able to kind of use that as almost like a tune-in message. Hey, I'm watching right now, and this is what channel it's on. Or, hey, I'm at the arena right now watching. You should come too. So we have, um, we're also going to be driving uh, contesting around that too. So while you're in game, watch on TV. Hey, win a pair of tickets, check in right now with the Trailblazers mobile app. And then we'll pull out the, the people that we'll pick, you know, for people to go and reward with that. Um, that's all using Facebook Connect. So you can't use the app unless you sign up with us through Facebook, Facebook Connect or through our trailer. On the left-hand side, um, this is kind of modeled after somewhat of a design from an app called Band of the Day. Really liking they did a really great job with that app. Um, 
It's to show some sort of a calendar, and we have games on the calendar, and you can easily navigate to the different games and um, obviously buy tickets or get in deeper by just clicking that Lakers versus Trailblazers and taking you in to get that games page, that games experience. Expansion of social. So social TV. Such a broadcast myself. Um, Dave Costello uh, from I think I'm saying this like, no, name correctly. Uh, from Twitter, CEO of Twitter, um, just was recently out there talking uh, and saying that his view of Twitter, the next step for Twitter, or the evolution of Twitter, is to be the second screen experience, which a lot of people are using that. And we see that today, especially with live events, live sporting events. He talked about the Olympics also, and the debates being something that has really driven a lot of Twitter use. Um, we see the same thing. You know, people at home, uh, if you're watching on television, or in arena, but really there's, there's a larger audience, say at home watching on television, how are we engaging with those people and letting those people express themselves around the team? Bigger yet, how do I, if I'm sitting by myself on a couch, how do I feel like I'm a part of 100,000 people watching the game, screaming at the same time? And that's something that, you know, text can do that, but not, it's not great. You know, Twitter, we use a, an app called Cover It Live, it's a live blogging platform. We have a chat that goes on our website during the games. You know, these are good, but they're very, um, you have to be very active, you have to be typing or thinking while the game's going on. So we're looking at ways to utilize video um, and social video um, in the future. You really want to go and figure out how you create a community and then echo that community. Uh, we use the hashtag Rick City. There's been a lot of conversation on whether we should be having a hashtag that changes per game or a hashtag specific just to you know, talk um, at different times of the day. Um, and, and ultimately, there's strategy behind all of it, but the strategy can work only if people adopt it. And really realizing right now, um, organically people are tagging either you know, hashtag Rick City or hashtag Blazers. We really think Rip City is a good way just to kind of show the community. It's our nickname for Portland or just Portland fans, a part of Rip City. And so that's what we use as our hashtag when we, we promote, we want people to talk about us or the game on television or radio or on digital, we use Rip City. Um, and so we just started this year uh, pulling out social commentary and running on pregame. Um, you can kind of see we've got three, it's kind of a a screenshot of three different ones. We've got uh, Facebook, uh, a tweet, and then an Instagram. We run that. Um, we've got our, one of our digital hosts who does a show pre-game, uh, pre-pre-game, technically on Trailblazers.tv. She goes on our television broadcast and talks about the social um, activity that's going on. And uh, we've seen, last night we had, I just did pull the numbers, and we had about uh, 1,500 tweets that used the hashtag Rip City, and um, from there the audience was uh, something like 2.2 million people that it went to go and reach all, throughout all those tweets. Um, so this is kind of how we're activating. Here's another piece too. During the game, we're still going to activate. We're going to activate this for our opening night. It's going to be a crawl on the bottom that are going to be bringing in tweets that we're going to curate. We're going to select. That's right there. Uh, and has anybody heard of the Skittles debacle? I mean, there's been a lot of them out there. McDonald's had a problem. Yeah. Skittles was the first one that I ever heard. Skittles decided to um, change their front page of, of their .com to be a hashtag search stream. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. So people were throwing really bad jokes up on Skittles' website for hours. And so um, that was obviously like... <laughs> A for, for you know, being out there and trying something new. F on, you know, really thinking it all the way through on how you get in the system. So, we curate these, uh, and also, I mean, not just saying that, this is one thing that, that um, I kind of firmly believe in. I think social content is really important. I think the conversation having with your fans is really important. Um, but also, you as an editor or as a brand manager or as somebody that is engaging with your fans and, and you are an authority about your brand and your, or your um, organization, curate the content. Not all content is equal. Good, good tweets should be floated up. You know, garbage should be probably suppressed. And so somebody, you, I don't know if you feel this way, I feel the same way when I look at my Facebook feed and I've got, you know, 
25 posts from people where I'm like, really? Again? Another thing about your breakfast or another thing about your dog? You're cool, but you know, when did this really, how did I feel? Like I got to know you better? And maybe that's what you really like. My point being, though, is as an organization, I really want to go and capture, like, and, and, and sing the praises of the fans that take the time to think about something that's really interesting. So, um, and that's true kind of wherever we, we promote tweets, especially in our, our television broadcast. Another uh, piece that we did this past year was uh, called Ticket Connect, the viral ticketing campaign. This is actually, uh, I was not shocked, but I was really surprised and, and, and very thrilled on how this went. Um, what we did was we sent out an email to season ticket holders and to employees and said, hey, thanks a lot for being a part of Rip City for these uh, preseason games. You can buy five and $10 tickets. Just click this link. So when you click through the link, there was a website where they registered using Facebook Connect. Um, and they would sign up for, for this, this site. Uh, they would, the next step is to, if they'd like to share this or provide email addresses to their friends, they could do so. The more uh, people who join the site that their friends uh, that were invited, uh, the more points they got. So they basically got uh, rewarded for selling their friends out. But they um, they went in and, and through the process had a leaderboard, and the top three got courtside seats or a suite or autographed gear. And actually, um, we saw some really good numbers that came on through with not only people who bought, but also people who signed up as well. With five to ten dollar tickets, we have forty thousand dollars in revenue, which is really awesome for a preseason game in five and ten dollar tickets. Preseason not being as high of a um, or as as wanted of a product as a regular season game. Um, and we had over four thousand tickets sold. I didn't put, I didn't put the number on how many uh, leads generated, but new leads, not just the season ticket, but new leads, was just north of two thousand. So we saw some really good, um, these are people who came back in and joined. It isn't just people who had, you know, so if you put in like your friends or your email address, it wasn't just automatically stored and we're gonna go and spam those people. You had to join the site. You had to go through the process. Um, expansion of the social. So the social arena, um, you know, one of the things that we're looking at towards the future of how, what's your, what's your stadium experience going to be like? When I walk through the doors, I have the Trailblazer app, we had the privilege to know a lot about you if you fill out your profile. Um, how are we activating you once you're in arena? How are we changing our uh, flat screens that have all of our, um, we've got all of our menus on there and all the different advertising, very much like Minority Report, but how are we using proximity-based marketing once you're in arena? Um, and one of the things with proximity-based marketing, we, at least I feel, is gonna be interesting um, how many people have an app called Highlight on their phone? I've got Highlight. Very few. Maybe you guys haven't heard about Highlight. Got a Highlight user? Maybe I'll buzz soon and I'll know that you're in the room. So Highlight was launched at South by Southwest. It's a proximity app. The way it works is I sign in with Facebook and then it knows my friends and what I'd like. If someone else has Highlight on their, their phone and we're within a, a radius of each other, it'll ping me saying, so and so is nearby, you've got two mutual friends. It only ping you if there's something in common or you have mutual friends. So you're not getting pinged all the time. What's really interesting to me is it's taking a loose community like we have, Trailblazer fans, that don't really know each other. But you have the ability to actually bring them closer together in real time or in a, a room like this um, or a bar in Chicago. So being a Trailblazer fan in a bar in Chicago might be really lonely because you're you think you're the only one there, but if it gets pinged, there's someone else there that's rooting for the Trailblazers that you watch on the TV, it just brings you that much closer. And that's something that um, it's, it's not easy to go and do, frankly, um, but with the phone, GPS, and stuff like proximity-based marketing and apps, that's really kind of helped out. So we're looking at baking that into our app in, in a future version, especially if you're in arena, um, you're gonna be pinged all the time, oh, look at all the Trailblazer fans. We're probably right in there if you went to college together, or be mutual friends, that sort of piece. Um, so you, once again, we're trying to go and tether people closer together. Okay, so this is the time that I've got, I think, 15 minutes for questions. And I did bring in uh, a t-shirt for the first question. And I've got uh, a pair of tickets for Friday's game and 
My name is Cameron. I'm going to put you on a guest list. So, do we have a question? This is called a bribe. Right here. Everyone says that. Good question. So um, I'm fortunate to have um, specialists on our staff. Some people are you know, content creators, some people are social specialists, some people are operations. I've got somebody who does front-end development and design, where he's doing all the front-end design and development, and we have the development shop that's doing the back-end. And uh, so it's a combination of the two. But um, what's nice about that, and we build out a trailblazer with fan like that, um, and a lot of our other platforms, is we're not beholden if we go in to a third party vendor to their licensing agreement. So if we do a deal for a year, you know, they all seem just, boom, there goes your rates. And you know, you don't really have anything to do except for pay those rates or build the app. Thank you. Got some tickets, we got, here we go, okay. I've got a mic for you. I was wondering how do you track users and do your analytics across your different platforms and websites, since you mentioned you know, various websites? Yeah, that is, it's, it's always difficult. Um, I just wish it was like, there you go. Through the MBA, we've got Omniture. This is our web analytics. We also use Google Analytics in-house. We've tied in our Google Analytics into our um, mobile app as well. Uh, the tracking of actual in social, um, we use uh, Social Engage, which is an exact target product. Uh, we also use um, a couple smaller plugins, especially for the broadcast, through our system that puts the graphics on television called Chiron. They've got a little social plugin that can get things on there. We are still trying to figure out what we want to go and do as far as the social communication or social conversation. So whether we want to go with a, a Radiant 6 or a Crimson Hexagon, uh, the conversation is coming in and bringing it back. But as far as um, you know, tracking conversions from Facebook into um, our commerce site and then the back end, starts with um, you know, our Google Analytics on the site. We also have some tracking that's within our e-commerce engine, tracking variables, and then we have our CRM in the back end too. So we use Microsoft Dynamics for that. Does that help? Yeah, okay. and, and is the shared database of users across the different platforms? Are you able to connect with the same person on the different websites? Uh, is that all through Facebook Connect or are you using a separate database of users? So right now we've got a, um, we have our CRM, kind of a database of record with a large data warehouse that has a couple different databases that go and um, push and pull information from each other. But we really look at the CRM as the one that should be the cleanest data. And so we have like I'm a Trailblazers fan database that runs the Facebook Connect. That's what the Facebook Connect kind of brings it into. And then channels it, all the information we have in the CRM and does matches on that. And if they're already an existing customer, fill out their information on CRM. If they're not an existing customer, write a new record as a lead. And then, then they get triggered into our email program to get a nurturing program if they're not already an existing customer. So I'll get you a pair of tickets and see me after we're done. Another data question, yes. That's a great question. And you want to say that, oh, of course, every, every decision is made right off of the strategy that's driven by, by the numbers. Um, a lot of the, obviously the easiest answer is the measurement of success is driven by your metrics, or failure is driven by your metrics. And I'll say that that's somewhat true for what we do if campaign did well, like this Ticket Connect, really surprised. I was expecting to maybe make five grand off that. Um, we're gonna do that and tweak it for the season and try to keep on rolling it out through the season. So if something flopped or only did 200, you failed, but please fail quickly and cheaply. You know, and so that's you know what, how we kind of you know, look at some of that stuff. Um, larger decisions, absolutely, as far as pricing the, the arena and um, our point of contact with our season ticket holders and really how we cultivate the season ticket holder, that's ultimately, that's our hardcore customer that we need to make sure we do it right. And that's really what the CRM is in place for, is to keep track of all that. So the big data um, helps drive a lot of that decision. Patrick. Uh, 
Um, uh, I'd say a lot of people here probably manage one to two websites or something for their companies, but you yeah. seem to have more, including mobile, including social yeah. media, things like that. So how do you manage that many digital entities, and kind of what is the team structure like? Sure, yeah, great question. So I'll do the team structure first and talk about just infrastructure as far as the platforms. Um, our team structure, originally when I came, board, came on board, it was just me in 2005 as a one-man shop, and I brought on someone part-time to be kind of like, just, I don't want to do this, please do this for me. Brought her on, she's now full-time, she's our operations manager. So I've got, she, we have myself, and then I really look at two arms of the department. We have sales and marketing, and we've got content. And she oversees the sales and marketing initiatives, and that includes projects like the mobile app development, um, but also social. I mean, you can do a ticket, ticket messaging, ticket sales, and sponsorship. So she either activates on the website, or she's got two people, one person doing development and design, um, and then another person who's kind of a social media instigator underneath her team. Um, on the content side, I oversee the content also. Um, we've got different digital reporters that are out there. So they update the Bloggers Network, they update their shows on .tv. We've got a live producer for Trailblazers.tv. So his job is to um, you know, run the software, run the camera, light the show, and then make sure that it's archived and up online and arranged on the site. So on the content side, we've got um, a digital reporter, uh, three digital hosts, and one of the digital hosts oversees the Bloggers Network, and a uh, live producer. So some of these are part-time positions, some full-time. Um, the full-times include uh, the operations manager, the uh, front-end development designer, and the digital host, who's our digital reporter, and then the rest are part-time. The infrastructure to kind of a way, like how do we get this all updated and we not have five different CMSs, and that's the trick. Um, one of the reasons why we built I'm a Trailblazers fan, or became very apparent quickly why this was a good idea, is the infrastructure we had from the NBA wasn't um, very robust. It was just out of date. Um, their content management system was that Trailblazers.com was built on top of. So we built on I'm a Trailblazers fan as our own content management system, like kind of a secondary CMS. And so uh, we've been able to build a lot of our initiatives off of that CMS. So the, the idea is the mobile app, all the feeds that feed into the mobile app for the news, the blogs, the scores, everything comes from the I'm a Trailblazers fan content management system. Um, the Bloggers Network is run off of I'm a Trailblazers fan. Trailblazers.tv for a large portion driven off of I'm a Trailblazers fan. So this is a, a CMS that's built so we can iterate off of it. We have since, mi since migrated over to Drupal for the NDA. And so that's been a lot more flexible, and we're going to start really thinking, do we port over a lot of our functionality over to Drupal to have it sit in one area off of trailblazers.com, or do we continue to operate at least two CMSs? So um, that's our primaries, and then we have those you know, social sites, and a lot of that stuff is done um, either through social engage or it's manually. You know, um, a, I don't know, maybe if we put up a, a new video, make sure we go and post that around to the different areas so we're, you know, Either the live video host is posting that, or the digital reporter is posting that, or the social media coordinator is posting that. So, so that's social stuff done manually. Can I get one more minute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure you guys get some tickets. So. personal and professional, uh, and making sure everybody's on message and doesn't, they don't step outside the bounds. And it's something that uh, we struggle all the time with. Players are a difficult, difficult, a difficult thing because they're employees, but also they have the freedom of speech. And so they use that as a platform. We can say, hey, do you mind tweeting this out? And, you know, most of them are cool. Sure, I'll go and do it. But I mean, it depends on what level of engagement they're going to be to, you know, really make sure the message, like they're probably, some, some of them work with their agents to, some of those tweets, and they'll go and you know help promote. But if it's an ongoing sort of, you know, hanging out today, check out my new shoes, like those sort of things, that's all on that. And there's not 
that's kind of they're on their own turf kind of. Yeah. 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 For employees, so for employees, we have you know some of the social media training that goes in. We're wanting to continue that. Um, the players are just a, a different. They're even though they are employees, it's just also a different level of employee. So they just have a larger microphone or megaphone. And oh, we got one back there. Um, so this is maybe on the heels of that question. The uh, I saw a little bit of the was it fine JJ? Yeah, yeah, that's great. The, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how that came about, and then how do you measure the success of something like that? Sure. So JJ Hickson is a, a guy we got uh, in March who joined our team in March of last year. So fairly new player, um, and uh, his agent came to us and said, "Hey, we really want to go and do something around Portland." Um, and he's kind of looked around a couple of different uh, players when they've done doing scavenger hunts or doing some areas, come finding sort of stuff. So we worked with him on locations um, and then how often and when should we launch this and what should we do. So worked with his agent and JJ Hickson is all, I mean, he does his own tweets all the time. And so um, where that's not necessarily true with all players or all celebrities, most of our guys, that's, especially on Twitter, that's them. Um, and so JJ um, Hickson went around town, and people he would send out on Twitter, "I am here at this location," and would tag it, pound, find JJ. Um, and the first people that came up there would get the pair of tickets, or would get you know an autograph thing, or whatever. And um, they had roughly you know a couple hundred people that followed them around, which um, the success was more, I think, in the sort of buzz that was created around Find JJ than actually the in-person. Um, it was done on a Saturday afternoon um, before we even had started camp. So they're going to do this throughout the year. They kind of wanted to test the waters to see how that did. Um, you know, talking with their, his agent, you know, he was with the previous agency and it didn't quite reflect his who he was. It was a little bit too polished. And JJ Hicks is a very blue collar guy who just likes to play basketball lift weights, and be humble. And he's not a flashy guy. They're kind of, his old agency was a little bit, you know, that was kind of in their their plans, where his new agent really wants him to be back to his roots. And so really talking to the fans, and this is a very good way for him to go and be able to do that in real time. So that's interesting you, you saw that, that. It was successful. I would say it was something else. Oh, we got another question over here. I'm like blinded for the. Oh, no question. No question. Oh, I thought that was pause. Okay, cool. Well, if you guys, um, I sent out on Twitter also. I was able to get a discount for you guys. If you guys want to buy tip trailer tickets, I put it up on my Twitter. I kind of went shh. Don't tell anybody, but I did a hashtag July 2012. So Darvison is the name of my Twitter handle, D A R B is in brilliant for basketball, I S O N. Um, and you can find it on that. Thank you. Thank you guys from my side for having me. Paul, guys. Thank you guys.